Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. We are so happy that you are here um, with us here at Grace International Baptist Church, especially on this first Sunday of the month of June. Month of June, we know that there's so much is going to happen. Month of June is my birthday. Month of June is also the beginning of the hurricane season. The month of June, we celebrate Father's Day. So there's so much happening during this month. Why we would have to keep on praying and asking God to help us, bless us as we go through the month. All right. Well, today we are going to be talking about what exactly is sin. What exactly is sin? That's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we go into God's word, let's close our eyes, bow our heads and speak, just ask blessings upon his word this morning. Father in heaven, we are so thankful, so thankful for you seeing us through for the first five, six, as we started the sixth month, the middle of the year. And Father, we give you thanks for all that you have done. Yes, there were times when things were difficult, when things were sad, when health might have not been the best, um, when we had to cry to you for provision. And Father, we know, we know that you were right there walking with us, holding our hands, and give you thanks. Lord, this morning, we ask that you will just energize us as we start this new week. Father, help us. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Help us, oh Father, that we will be able to keep looking up, knowing that our help, our strength, our guide, our provision, all comes from you. And all we have to do is to give you thanks and to live for you. Thank you for what you have done. This morning, Lord, we are so pray that you will bless the, uh, each one of us. You know our need, our specific need. Each one who is under the sound of my voice. Father, whether it is for strength, if it is for wisdom, if it is for healing, if it is for provision, if it is for guidance, Lord, we give it all to you. And open our eyes now and help us as we look into your word. Bless us now in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, I'm going to um, invite you to open it to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. And we are going to read from verse 16 to 21. 1 John chapter 5, and we are going to read from verse 16 to 21. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow us on the screen. And it says this, if you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I am not saying you should pray for those who committed all wicked actions are sin, but not every sin to death. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God and know we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from any 
thing that might take God place, your heart. So we are here now with the question: What exactly is sin? What exactly is sin? How does the Bible define sin? What is the Bible teaching about sin? Well, in order to avoid sinning, it's essential we know exactly what sin is and how God sees sin. Sin is generally thought of as something bad. Growing up in the Sonic school, I remember how we used to define sin. Sin we used to define it as sin is anything you say or do or think that goes against what God wants. Let me repeat it. Sin is anything you say, you do, or you think that goes against what God wants. So to sin can be to miss the goal or target, or even to rebel, um, reject, or ignore God's standards. It is to fall short of what God expects of us. Sin making um, a, a decision or living a lifestyle that violates the law of God. We can think of sin as the opposite of righteousness. Because righteousness is living in God's just and right standard. While sin is falling, failing to live by those standards. Over the years, conversation about sin especially from the pulpit, have become outdated or out of style. But it shouldn't be so, because sin is just as dangerous and destructive now as it has been since Adam and Eve finished the fruits in the garden. So it should not be taken lightly. So let us go then and Let's see all that we can learn about sin today. First question, what is sin? What is sin? In the Bible, the, the word sin, whether it is in the Old Testament or New Testament, it means to miss the mark. The reason this definition is so important is because it points to two things. And what are these two things? Number one, that there is a target we are aiming at. And number two, it speaks of our intention. Let's, let's go over that again. What is sin? It is first, there is a target we are aiming at. And secondly, it speaks as our, of our intention. Once we know there is a target, then we can choose to hit it. Or this is. The target is God's word or command, and when we miss this target, we have committed sin. What makes something sinful is when we know what we are supposed to do and we choose not to do it, then we are engaging in sin. For something to be sinful, we must be aware that it violates what God desires us to do. This is not always determined by a written code, but it is also evident by the moral code that God has passed in every human heart. So in other words, we can't go say, okay, let me go look and see in all the commandments that God gives in his word is doing this is sin. Well, you may not find it word for word and say, thou shalt not eat to things that say. Um, um, you know, something that you can think of. I, I didn't um, look 
look into that one therefore now, but it is something that you need to pay attention to. But the 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 gist is there, the 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 the, the lesson that we have to learn is there. So because of that, we got to hold on to it. Because remember, it is a target that we have that we have to aim at, which is God's word. The target, God word is a target, and then secondly, we have our intention. It's like, why am I doing this? You see, why am I choosing to do that? We will get some more of that as we go along through our study this morning. Second question What does the Bible say about sin? What does the Bible say about sin? As I said before, sin is not something that should be taken lightly. And the Bible speaks a lot and especially about sin. The Bible warns us to avoid such serious sin as sexual immorality, um, idolatry, um, stealing, drunkenness, exhortion, murder, spiritism, homeless words, and unintentional actions that hurt others. You see? That is what the Bible is saying. Let's look at some verses that speaks to the nature of sin. You know, because remember, we want to see what does the Bible say about sin. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Listen, we all have sinned. Say, oh, not me. No, 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 no. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. It claim, if we claim to be without sin, that's what the Bible says. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's what the Bible says. Out of Galatians, chapter number six and verse eight, it says, Whoever told to pleasure, or whoever told sorry to sleep their flesh, from the flesh will reap this problem. Whoever goes to face the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Proverbs 28 13 says, Whoever conceives that sin, not trust, but the one who confesses and renounces their sin finds mercy. John chapter 8, verse 13 to 4. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. That's what Jesus said. Okay, and Romans chapter 6 and verse 12 and through 14, it said, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offers every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Listen, all we need to do is to live our lives to the mark that God has given us to live by. Those guilty of serious sin can feel overwhelmed by the weight of their mistakes. Hey, David, he wrote in Psalm 38, 4, he said, my sins loom over my head. My errors, my sin looms over my head like a heavy burden. They are too much for me to bear. That's why David cried to the Lord. The Bible does offer this hope in Isaiah 55, 7. It says, let, let the wicked man leave his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him return to Jehovah who will have mercy on him. For he will forgive in a large way. For our God will forgive those in a large 
way. Now, what is sin so serious then? What is sin so serious to God? That's what we may ask. Well, we need to grasp that sin isn't a private thing that only affects me, but sin is this hateful in God's sight since God is a holy God. And that sin will also have consequences for us and our relationships with God and others. Why is sin against, um, against God's superior? Well, the answer is that because God is holy. He is pure. He is righteous. He, is, he cannot tolerate sin or tolerate even the presence of sin. You see, there are many reasons why sin is so serious to God. Number one, it's because sin dominates. Sin dominates. When you think about what sin is, you must recognize that sin looks to dominate a person's life. Sin doesn't come in to be nice. Sin comes in to take control. Sin is a relentless master that looks to steer, direct every aspect of a person's life. So before we got saved, whether you realize it or not, you were dominated and controlled by sin. Sin controls them. And even though you are a believer, sin is still looking to take back control now. This is a part of, of the talk of war we experience as believers, wrestling with the thought of sin that desires to have a back have us back under his control and the pull of the Spirit calling us to live a godly life. That's the talk of what we keep having, you see. But Galatians chapter, um, chapter 5 and verse 16 and 17 say, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the spirit of the contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. See, we have to hold on to God's standards because if we allow sin to take control, it will dominate us. Sin is deceitful. Because it appears to be seductive and enticing. Sin deceitfully promised what it cannot deliver. Promised pleasure, contentment, fulfillment, love itself. But sin only results in fleeting, unsatisfying moments of whatever it promises. Sin's deceitful is the best reason. What it, 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 it is addictive and dominating. It lures us to, to, to chase after what it can never deliver. As people continue to believe in sin's promises, they are forced into greater and deeper perversion until the final result. And you know what's the final result? Not only does sin dominate, but sin also devastates. You see, there is a truth about sin that we often don't want to admit. Sin is destructive. Sin destroys lives, it destroys families, it destroys relationships, it destroys career, it destroys ministries. If you allow it to linger, it will destroy everything in its path. That is why sin is so dangerous. The scripture tells us over and over that sin leads to death and destruction because there are consequences with going against the grain because of how God designed us to live and obey Him. 
physically, then can cause an internal conflict with God and us, leading to health issues and taking a physical toll on our body. There are many examples from the Bible that shows the devastation that happened as a result of sin. However, just look around at all the brokenness we see in our world. It is all the result of the devastating nature of sin. One reason you must avoid sin is because it seeks to destroy you. Sin initially appears as good fruits, pleasing to the eye, but behind it, destructive consequences which seeks to ruin our lives. Paul made it abundantly clear that sin has um, consequences and then describes the end of those who indulge in sinful behavior. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, 7, and 8 say, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, that nature will reap its drought. You see, the phrase sinful nature here refers to one's stubborn, shameless self. Though the sin nature may promise fulfillment, it can result in nothing but destruction. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 describes those who choose to indulge in sin as being darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sens sensuality so to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lot of men. One of the consequences of sin, therefore, is more sin. You see, there's a little less lot for more, attended by a, a, a dulling of the conscience and a blindness of spiritual truth. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. So not only does sin um, dominate or sin that uh, devastates, but also sin separates. Perhaps the most serious aspect of sin is that it is the only thing that separates us from God. Because God is holy. Sin cannot dwell in his presence. Thus, it is, it is the reason why it separates us from God. Romans chapter 8 talks about what, is, what can separate us from the love of God. The argument Paul was making here is that there is nothing and no one that could ever, ever separate us from God. But nothing that happens to us or is done to us will ever keep us from God's love. However, while nothing outside of us can separate us from God's love, the choices that we make can, meaning that if we choose to live in sin and continue in sin, we will ultimately be separated from God's love. Remember, God is holy. Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15, tells us, blessed are those who walk their robes, that they may have the rights to the tree of life. That meaning those 
Those of us who ask Jesus to be our Savior. Those of us who are believers. And then it may go through the gate into the city. We will receive the promise that God has given us that we will live forever with Him. But outside, those who don't, don't make that decision, but outside, the gods, those who practice magic, art, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. You see, they will be able to, to enjoy the place that God has prepared. That's why before we die, we have to make that decision. You see, so it is important for us to know, for us to know that sin dominates, that sin devastates, and that sin separates. Then, can I know if something is, is sin? Well, thankfully, we have two gauges in our lives to help us define and know what sin is. The first gauge is the word of God. And the second gauge is the spirit of God. The word of God is clear in defining things that are black and white, who know they are sinful without any question or room for debate. For example, you don't have to ask except your relation with someone of um, other than your spouse or taking something that you do not belonging to you or cheating on your taxes, maybe at table. Because the Bible is clear on that. And then we have the Spirit of God. That one will be fine for us. When sometimes we are not sure because the Bible didn't say it, you know, like a law. And the word, um, the Holy Spirit then will give us and let us know or convince us, you see, and tell us that is not right. That is sinful. Together, we will keep you from missing the mark and continue living a life pleasing to God. You see? And then we ask again, are there different levels of sin? Are there different levels of sin? The first thing you must be clear on is that all sin is sin. James chapter 2 verse 10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Okay, so for example, if we committed to sin, God cannot say, he will not say, okay, just all of your other parts of your body can go to heaven, but not this right arm or this left arm. You see, no. It's once we do commit to sin, our relationship with God is immediately broken. So we need to go back, confess to God, and then we rekindle, come back to God, and that relationship will be restored. What we sometimes have to realize is that while all sin is bad and destructive, some sin have a high price tag attached to them than others. This means the consequences attached to engaging in certain sin is greater than others. It does mean the sin itself is greater, just the price you pay, you see, for indulging in it. See, what you must also be aware of is that your sin does not just affect your life. It affects other people's lives as well. The greater the influence you have, the greater the impact of your sin. This doesn't mean the sin you committed was greater. It just means it affected your people. You see, each level of sin produces negative effects in 
Sin will destroy them. Sin destroys innocence. Sin corrupts the person's once innocent mind so that he does not look at circumstances or life in quite the same way anymore. You know, it is so much easier then and now for, for you to be able to excuse or accept or, or you know, say that, hey, you know, it's not really bad. Say this to ideals. You see, when we become involved in sin, we start a truly process. At first, we might regret sin with horror, horror, and shame. But when we indulge in it continuously, we soon become immune to it. And worse, we start to be for it. See, it destroys ideals. Sin destroys the will. The will, I'm sorry. The will is the power that allows our mind to make choices and do it to carry them out. There's an old saying that goes, sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit and reap a character. Sow a character and reap a destiny. See, it destroys our will. Sin produces slavery. This is the direct result of the destruction of people's will. When a person sins, he isn't doing what he likes, but what sin likes. See, sin produces sin. We all, we all experience this at one time or another. Although we might not have recognized it as sin producing more sin. Sin produces sickness, pain, and evil. It's not easy to make a distinct between sin and sickness, illness, or a poor, a poor, weak, a rundown state of health may not be the direct result of a specific sin. It could be the product of a series of sin committed over a prolonged period. For example, those who are addicted to drugs, alcohol, illicit sex, you see, there's the consequences later in life that you are now reaping. Sin produces death. The ultimate result of slavery to sin is death. Trapped in the intense bondage to sin, death is the final outcome that no one can escape. Well, there's one fitting way to conclude the sermons about what is said. The conclusion is those who do not measure up to God's perfect standards will be condemned to eternal punishment in a lake of fire. The Bible calls this the second death. The judgment certain it is something that is going to happen. The eternal punishment in a lake of fire, the second death is known commonly today simply as hell. People, my friend, hell is real and is the punishment for all who do not hear God's call to repent and to believe in Him and to accept His gift of salvation. Now, the Bible teaches that God is merciful, um, and therefore he does not want to found anyone with eternal condemnation and a second death. Therefore, in John chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible tells us that God is love. It's an amazing truth that God loves us even when we sin against him. He loves us in spite of of what we are set because of who he is, a kind, loving, and merciful God. But, but, Bible also tells us 
that God is love, the same Bible that tells us that God is love also tells us that God is also a just and therefore he must punish sin. In Exodus 47, 17, it says, when people sin, God says, I punish them. So on one side, God loves us and he doesn't want to punish us. On the other hand, because he is also a God of justice, he must punish the sin in our lives. How then does God resolve this, this tension between his law and justice? Well, a wrongdoer, a sinner, cannot take the, cannot place of another wrongdoer or justice for justice to be served. This means that no human being can ever take the punishment for the sin of another human being. Because remember, all human beings have sinned and violated God's law. Only a person who has lived a perfect, sinless life is worthy of taking our place for the punishment of our sin. And that person is Jesus. Jesus is fully God, and in that he is the in, infinitely mighty God who created and sustains all things. Yet, he died. Also, uh, is a fully man, in that he was born today, some 2,000 years ago. He grew up, faced adversary like you and me, yet lived a perfect and sinless life, healing the sick and teaching the world's greatest lessons on how to live life on this earth. When he came at the end of his earthly life, to the very hour for which he had been born, he died on a cruel Roman cross. On our behalf, he paid the penalty for our sins. This means that all our sins were laid on him and he atoned our guilt. In this way, for God's love for us and the need for his justice satisfied. And to prove that our debt of sin had been fully paid, Jesus Christ rose from the dead after three days. Now the living Christ offers eternal life, the gift of eternal life to you and I and to every person, and he is offering it as a free gift. This gift is received by faith. Faith is not simply knowing in our mind that God and Jesus Christ exist, for the Bible says in the book of James, chapter 19, you believe that there is one God, excellent. But remember, even the demons believe that, and they tremble. No, it's faith merely believing in Jesus Christ to help us out of an emergency. For example, when we are sick and need healing, or in financial difficulty, and he's bailing out, etc., when the emergency is over, he's not having faith in it. No. Why then should I try to live a good life and do good deeds in the gift of eternal life is received by faith alone? That's the reason. The reason for living a godly life is simply gratitude to God for his gift of eternal life. It's our way of saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The motive for godly Christian living is always gratitude to God for his gift life to us. But my friends, this morning, this is probably the most important question you will ever have to answer in your life. Would you like to receive 
God's gift of eternal life? Would you like to receive God's gift of eternal life? If your answer is yes, you need to clarify what it is about. Number one, you need to confess that you have sinned against God in your attitude, your word, and your action. Ask for and receive his forgiveness. Repent. Turn from your sinful ways and follow God's ways as revealed in the Bible. Secondly, you need to believe. Believe that Jesus Christ alone can save you and that he died and rose again to give you eternal life. Thirdly, you need to receive, accept Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior and also as your Lord. If this is what you really want, then it is time for you to make that decision. It is a decision that can only happen between you and God. Now pray and ask God to receive you. You pray and ask God. Me, it is a personal thing, it is a personal decision. Father, we ask that you will continue to speak to the hearts of those that are. Father, if they do not know you as Lord and Savior, if they have not believed and accept, oh Father, that gift that Jesus came and gave to us as the gift which is salvation. Lord, I ask you will open their eyes, open their mind, open their understanding so that they will be able to know it is time to do this because no one knows what later holds. No one knows what tomorrow holds. Only Father this morning, I ask that they will just bow their head and cry to you and ask you for Thank you, Father, for what you have done. Thank you for your word that tells us so clearly what sin is and what it can do to us. And the Lord, you provided a way that we can be saved. Help us, O oh God, to accept this way, this gift. Thank you again. And we now, Jesus, precious name, my prayer, and we need Wow. We would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to today's service. We will invite you to join us again next Sunday at the same time. If you would like to attend our Sunday worship service at 11 on Zoom, please contact us at allbecauseofgrace at gmail.com and we will send you the Zoom. We will love the opportunity to share Christ with you and to help you grow in His Word like we did this morning. If you have prayed that prayer, if you want some more help, please contact us at all because of grace at gmail.com and let us know how we can pray for you and help. Here are all our contact information. You can take it down and contact us, and we will be able to help you when we know what your so this morning, we love you. God loves you. And He wants you to be able to 
come and live with him for eternity. But he said, sin can separate us from God. But God make a way that we can go to him and ask him for forgiveness. And he will forgive us and cleanse us and be able to go to the place he prepared for us. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord go with you. May the Lord guide you as we face this new week. We pray that he will be with us all the day. Next week, we will be able to give him praise for what he has done for us during this week. Thank you. And God bless you.